Uh, thank you everybody for coming. It's very nice to see lots of faces interested in this topic, um, which is close to my heart personally and um, has been very, there's been a lot of um, talk about it in the past six months since Tunisia and, uh, and Egypt came to the headlines. Now, before I talk about what it's like now and what the problems are now, what the Arab Spring means for women, I want to talk, I want to give a bit of background on uh, women in the Arab world. Um, can you all hear me? Thank you. Um, a problem that I face is people tend to lump all Arab women into one. And the Arab world extends from Morocco, actually Mauritania almost, to the west of Africa, to um, the Arabian Gulf, which is kind of the Arab Peninsula. And the cultures are very, very different across kind of swathes of the Middle East, the Gulf, and North Africa. And I think we need to first talk about where things are hardest and where the problems are deepest in the Arab world um, and the different types of problems women face. And just very quickly, I'm going to kind of focus mostly on um, North Africa, the Levant, and the Gulf. Now, the problems in the Gulf are very different to the problems in North Africa. Gulf women, Saudi Arabia women, Kuwaiti women, kind of oil-rich Gulf countries have a very specific type of grievance. And North African um, and Levantine Arab countries have other grievances. And you find that there's lots of trade-offs. So, for example, in the Gulf... Uh, you're generally very wealthy, you're chauffeured around, you've got designer handbags and, and you, you, know, you, you go on holiday to, to uh, Europe, but you can't drive, you can't vote, um, you can't marry outside your nationality. And then you have people in uh, North Africa and the Levant, women in North Africa and the Levant, who have very difficult day-to-day -day lives, but generally more autonomy. You know, they can drive, they can vote, they're politically active, and therefore the whole kind of burqa-clad Arab woman image isn't very accurate. Um, and I think this is probably a good place to start, is that there's actually quite a lot of relative freedoms in the Arab world. Um, and not necessarily linked to how women look or how they dress, because ostensibly they can look very free um, or very covered up, but, but have different levels of, um, of autonomy. Um, since Tunisia and Egypt kind of exploded onto the international political scene, um, there's been lots of focus on Arab women. That's a good place to start, I think, in that they have kind of been tokenized a little bit. Um, and we, see, we used to see pictures of women in Tahrir Square on CNN and BBC and people saying this is absolutely remarkable, you know, women in Tahrir Square side to side with men. It, I mean, that's not a novel thing. As far as Egyptians are concerned, women have been um, active in the political scene for quite a long time. But the Western media um, liked this narrative because it was very... It was very neat that freedoms were being handed out and, and uh, dictatorships were being dismantled, and you could see immediately the result of it, which is that women were there, they were out there. Um, but women, it, particularly in Egypt and North Africa, have a long, long history of political activity. Um, and even in Sudan, where I'm from, I find that women have become weaker and um, they've become more limited in their, in their scope. My mother's generation and my grandmother's generation was much more empowered than my generation in Sudan. Um, and so I think that in t what, it, what it has done, however, the Arab Spring is kind of focused internally women's minds on such a thing as a women's movement um, because it was quite atomized in the past. It was mostly the elite, especially in Egypt. Um, it was, the, the women's movement in Egypt was, was um, uh, sponsored by Suzanne Mubarak, who was the, obviously Hassan Mubarak's wife, and it was a very elitist movement, and it was kind of women who went and had lunch and coffee and, and opened a ward in a hospital and then went home and felt very pleased with themselves, as opposed to women who went into the slums and talked to other women. It was very, it was very class-ring fenced. 
What has happened, which I am noticing, is that there is kind of a very uh, clear, nascent, collective consciousness that women in the Arab world are linked or are related, and it's sort of jumped from country to country. Uh, and I find that very heartwarming that a woman in Saudi Arabia has some kind of affinity with a woman in Egypt, or a woman in Sudan, or a woman in Tunisia. The challenges are, however, how do we turn that into something tangible and something with momentum? Um, I'd like to just tell a little story about something that happened in Egypt, which is a good microcosm of the problems that, that we're facing. Uh, during the first few weeks of the Hadith Square, it was very, um, it was kind of a party atmosphere, it was a carnival atmosphere. Women spent the night there with their husbands and their brothers, and uh, they cooked and they kind of brought food over, and there was a lot of camaraderie. Uh, and then, after Mubarak fell, there was a pro peace, not even a protest, it was a kind of march by Egyptian women in Tahrir Square to celebrate International Women's Day. And it was, I would say, a handful, 100, 200 women came to Tahrir, and the crack, I mean, I, even I was surprised, the crackdown on that protest was brutal by, not only by police, but by just stand by, you know, men standing by, pedestrians, kind of, and they came and they, they were shouting at the women, and it was really, really disturbing. Um, they said to them, go home, it's not your time, this isn't what the revolution was about, and then it became very clear to me that there are much, much deeper things that no matter what you change politically, will always be a problem, and kind of political change. And this is linked to other things as well in Arab culture. Political change is almost <laughs> the least effective way, because it creates a veneer. And you think, we, we were kind of, remember myself and my friends and my colleagues and peers, we were kind of under this false impression that something big had happened after Mubarak fell. And even we got carried away and then realised that absolutely nothing had happened, that absolutely nothing had changed. And if anything, we had taken our eye off the ball because we were distracted by the fact that this kind of, you know, octogenarian 40-year-old, you know, 40 years in power dictator had been toppled and kind of had stopped thinking about the fact that there are grassroots misogynies and grassroots problems and discrimination against women. Um, and minorities and children and lots of other things that people kind of hadn't paid attention to. And then I personally kind of got back to writing and talking about it with a vengeance because I became very paranoid about the fact that I didn't want to kind of be celebrating the fact that Mubarak had gone um, and Ben Ali had gone and, and Syria was happening and Libya was happening. But in fact there were deeper problems that we weren't talking about um, and so that's, that's when I came to realise that we had begun to tokenise these women in these protests. And there's three, three women in particular. One woman in Yemen called Tawakul Karman, I'm not sure if anybody's heard of her. She's been the mascot of the Yemeni revolution. Um, she's kind of quite, very strong and she's quite young and she's got uh, two, three children and she's from a very big tribe in Yemen and wears the hijab and kind of speaks to men in a very forceful way. And there's lots of love for her and lots of respect for her from men. But the moment that there was any serious talk about her becoming president or prime minister or having any role, that was shut down very um, swiftly by men. I kind of thought, we are all complicit in this. Women and men are complicit in this, in that they like to hold up women. Actually, it's men that, that lead it, or Arab men, that say, look, things are so bad, even the women, even these gentle creatures who don't get involved in politics are here. That's how bad it is, as opposed to, this is their right as much as it is our right. And therefore, there was kind of a false amplifying of women's role in the Arab Spring, because it was kind of a, a, a nice narrative to have, like, you know, even the women have come out. And that kind of undermines the role of women a little bit, and I think we need to stop looking. I, I personally would encourage people to stop looking at these figureheads, 
and look more. I mean, these are figureheads that are very of the establishment anyway. They're kind of, you know, from big tribes, they're from big families, they are married into, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's, these are women kind of of the tradition. And there are other women like Noana Sadawi in Egypt and um, other kind of atomized women who are very marginalized and have always been so, that are the ones who are kind of on the front lines um, in, in, their, in their disparate countries. And so I think grassroots activity, people who are women who are in houses and who are in hospitals and who are in, I know it sounds vague, but it is, you know, it is that atomized, that has the kind of detail you need to get into, as opposed to those who are on, um, the, this is on the telly and sort of debating with men because they're the ones that men have allowed there because they, they, they have some currency, I suppose. Does that make sense? So where we are now is a rather scary place where we have been told that there are far more important things to be dealt with first than women's rights. I kind of understand that personally. I know where people are coming. Even women say this, not just men. It is, it, women and men say, not now. And I kind of understand because if you try and imagine what it's like to live in a country where you have been governed by the same people and the same faces for decade after decade after decade. It creates a paralysis and a stagnation of everything. Only when it goes do you realise just how much of a vacuum there was in terms of, of political infrastructure, economic infrastructure, uh, um, cultural infrastructure, it was all kind of led by this very small elite in these countries. And so when that happens, it's, this is this is a kind of metaphor, I think, this is how I think about it in my own, it's like when, it's like as if you've burned a house down and then somebody comes and says, we need to talk about the paintings that we're going to put up. And then somebody says to you, no, we need to, we need to build the, the actual house up again and, and furnish it. And that's how people think of women's rights in the Arab world now, is that, you know, we we burn the house down, we can't start thinking about how we're going to decorate it. We have to think about far more fundamental problems. Because that, that not now sort of move that you spoke about, that, you know, that, that's been around, that was around here when the women's movement started. Yeah. It's, it's, it's often sort of, we were talking about race earlier, it's often brought up generally when there are discussions about race, when there are discussions about poverty. It's so often, not now, there are, there are bigger fish, there are more important things to worry about. Mm. Um, and so it's interesting, but not surprising, mm. that that's exactly what's going on. Mm.